We're now going to continue with our next speaker, which is Michael O'Rourke, who is a professor of philosophy from Michigan State University, East Lansing. And he does research and is interested in uh, facilitating uh, dialogues between people working in cross-disciplinary collaborations. And he's going to talk about how to do that and a method or a, a way of, of actually helping people to engage in dialogue in uh, research teams. Thank you, Ava. Good morning. I am really grateful to have the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, Lund is a beautiful city, and it's my first time in Sweden, and I'm amazed. It's uh, kind of in love with this place. Um, and I, So I'm really very grateful for the chance to come and, and uh, talk to you about the work that we've been doing. I'm also interim director of the MSU Center for Interdisciplinarity and uh, the director of the Toolbox Dialogue Initiative, and I'll focus on that in my remarks this morning. It wasn't my plan, but it turns out that I, I think you could just see the talk that I'm about to give as a, an example of uh, service asymmetry. So this is where philosophy is in a kind of a service role uh, to interdisciplinary science. So. Um, I'll let you be the judge of whether that's a legitimate way of thinking about what I'm talking about here. But I'm going to talk about facilitation of interdisciplinary communication from a philosophical perspective. And here's uh, an outline of the talk. I'll start by very quickly setting the context, um, providing a sense of how I think about interdisciplinary research. Before I focus on the challenge of unacknowledged differences, I'll introduce structured dialogue as a response to that challenge and then talk a little bit about the toolbox approach, which is a philosophically structured dialogue approach designed to address the challenge of unacknowledged differences. And then I'll, I'll end by reflecting on a few of the philosophical aspects of the work that we've been doing. So to begin, uh, just to kind of in the spirit of defining one's terms, I'm, I'm going to provide a uh, way of thinking about interdisciplinary research that lines up with what we do in the toolbox dialogue initiative. This is not innovative. Um, this, is some, this doesn't go... Uh, really all, all that far away from what everybody's already aware of, but research that integrates inputs such as insights, methods, data from different disciplines. Okay, and here I'm thinking about disciplines as, I guess in the Kuhnian style, as uh, intrinsically constituted and maintained sets of knowledge practices that are sufficiently widespread and stable to receive institutional support. Now, I like this way of thinking about disciplines because it captures both the epistemic dimensions of disciplinary practice, so the, the dimensions that are focused on disciplines as knowledge construction sort of institutions, but then also the social dimension, right? So it's, it's uh, easy, I think, especially for philosophers and epistemologists like me, to lose sight of the social dimension when you, when you think about things like this, but it's really important when you're doing interdisciplinary work to keep that in view. So if you have worked in an interdisciplinary context, as I'm thinking almost everybody, if not everybody in here has, you know that this sort of work confronts a variety of challenges that have been discussed in the literature under a number of different headings, logistical, institutional, interpersonal. Here's a, a relatively long uh, sort of laundry list of challenges that are, that are well discussed in the literature. Elizabeth mentioned the, the challenge of uh, sort of group dynamics, right? The, the fact that at the end of the day, we're all just people trying to get along and do something together. Um, and there are a number of other challenges that are especially vexing for collaborators in, in interdisciplinary space. Communication is the one that we focused on in the Toolbox Dialogue Initiative. And the specific communication challenge that I'm interested in today is this challenge of unacknowledged differences among collaborators. So I think this that if I listen to Elizabeth correctly, that the idea that um, you've, you sort of emphasized about your project at the beginning was that, that you have all these more or less strangers in the room working together and they have to get to know one another, right? And so there are some differences are perhaps easier to spot and discuss than others. Um, the differences that I'm especially interested in are the, 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 the ones that are harder to spot. So these can, these can uh, be grounded in the way in which collaborators speak, so the technical vocabularies they use, the differences they have in core beliefs, values and priorities, as well as the, the different sorts of cultures that they became experts in and so that they're used to, that sort of uh, form their expectations. You might think that if you get a group of really well-intentioned investigators together, um, focused on a project they are all passionate about, that something like this wouldn't be a problem, or that everybody would, would 
you know, be poised at the front end to, to, to dig out these unacknowledged differences and acknowledge them. And sometimes that happens. Um, but it's not uncommon that it doesn't. And the reason that I think this is, or at least one reason why I think this is uh, uh, not an uncommon uh, difficulty has to do with how we're trained. So the, the sorts of training that we receive when we're in graduate school on the way to becoming an expert foregrounds certain aspects of the world and backgrounds other aspects, right? So in philosophy, I was trained to see the world in terms of concepts, to think about conceptual conditions, right? So what are the conditions, satisfaction of which qualifies something as falling under an, ins of, under an instance of a concept? Right, that's the kind of the way that I thought about everything that I encountered in graduate school and beyond. Um, and, I, and arguments are sort of the vehicle of change in philosophy. In the life sciences, you might have, instead of conceptual conditions, something like DNA that, that's foregrounded in your training. And then hypotheses and experiments um, as sort of methodological things that are foregrounded. Now, we build graduate education programs with a view to to almost artificially foregrounding the things that matter to us. So you put graduate students in seminars and you, you create situations in which the stuff that matters shows up all the time, right? And as you, as you become an expert, right, you, you, you see these aspects more frequently, become better at spotting them. Eventually, they just sort of become obvious, right? It's like, of course the world is full of conceptual conditions. Doesn't everybody see that? Doesn't, doesn't everybody see the logical tensions that exist with concepts like justice and reference? And I mean, I think the answer to that's pretty, pretty obviously no, but, um, but it's, it's, that's kind of lost on philosophers. Um, and in our own discipline, we're dis disincentivized from talking about, uh, to talk about the obvious stuff, right? So the stuff that we, that we become really accustomed to in our training that becomes obvious for us um, is a part of the background that we can assume when we work with our disciplinary collaborators, right? And you never want to become known as the, the, oh, the, he's the one that talks about the obvious stuff, right? You want to be the one who talks about the interesting stuff, right? The problem is that in interdisciplinary contexts, What's obvious to you may very well not be obvious to somebody else, right? They're trained differently. Different things have been foregrounded for them. They're going to see the world in a different way than you. And if you don't root out those differences, that can be a real problem for an interdisciplinary collaboration, right? You can run into obstacles in de deliberation and decision making. Here's an example from our work. Imagine a team working on ecosystem services in the inland northwest that comprises a rural sociologist, ecologist, and a hydrologist. And this team, in, the ecologist in this team, um, just thought science was hypothesis testing. That's how she had learned to think of science. So you t form hypotheses, you test hypotheses. That's what it is to be a scientist. Um, the hydrologist, though, who had been trained as a geologist, really didn't think of his work in terms of hypotheses. Right? That's not how we thought of it. And there were some problems with them in terms of figuring out how to write proposals and manuscripts that were related to the fact, it turns out, that they had very different attitudes about the priority of hypotheses. When that emerged, it was a sort of jaw-dropping moment for the ecologist, right? The idea that this collaborator who she respected and trusted could be a scientist yet not use hypotheses the way she does, that was just shocking to her. But that, and that, that had a kind of reformation effect on, on that group. And they were able to kind of figure out what the problem was and then go forward from there. Well, I mean, it seems kind of obvious if the problem's unacknowledged differences, then you should acknowledge them, right? Um, this requires, though, that the relevant commitments be identified and articulated. So you need to know where to look and you need to know how to articulate them, how to say them in a way that they can be heard as core aspects of your research worldview by your collaborators. You know, once you're able to do this, if you're able to do this, then you can coordinate those commitments, kind of figure out who might be in a, a really good position to do one thing as opposed to another thing in the project, right? Given your commitments, maybe you're, you should handle this part of the project as I'll work on this part. If there's tension, then, then articulating these differences can, can put you in a position to negotiate them. But in my experience, at least, this is tricky. Um, again, there's that disincentive to talk about and honestly even think about the obvious stuff, right? I mean, life's just too short, right? Overwhelming is the new busy, right? So, so you know, we just don't have time to think about the obvious stuff. We have to think about the interesting stuff. So we, we tend to kind of lose sight of that. It becomes a part of the background that we assume when we 
launch into deliberation and decision making. Um, as a result, we're not sensitive to the commitments that matter. There's a lot of things that probably qualify as obvious to us. We need to find out which ones among that set are the ones that matter for this particular collaboration. And sometimes that's not, that's not one of the obvious things. <laughs> right? So that, can, that takes work to, to achieve. Dialogue, in uh, my experience and also from the literature, can, can be a mechanism that assists us in this, uh, in this effort, in the effort of acknowledging these differences. So here we think of dialogue in a, in a thick way as a, a relational mode of communication where you have agents who are speakers and listeners at the same time, right, that um, engage in a kind of communicative activity that's reciprocal and that involves uh, a certain kind of dispositional poise where, where speakers are, speaker listeners are sort of um, kind of structured in their engagement with, with one another by expectations and sort of counterfactual dependencies. Like if she, if she says this, then I'll say that, or right, you kind of ha have a way of thinking about how the structure of the, of the um, conversational episode. This supports uh, the joint creation of meaning. Um, it involves active listening with increased back channel signaling from listener to speaker. Um, and it can create, as Bakhtin put it, a mutually entangled state where interlocutors can root out um, mutual non-understanding. So this is dialogue maybe in its most uh, uh, impressive ideal form perhaps. But when, when we are able to engage in this kind of communication, it's a communication that can have a, a real power for unearthing what's implicit. Structured dialogue I think is even better, uh, at least for the purposes um, that we're talking about at this symposium. If you structure a dialogue, you focus it on topics or themes, right? If that provide a, provides a, a frame for expectations, contributions, and interpretations. So, nobody, again, nobody's got time to think about process. We're not incentivized to think about process. We are incentivized to produce stuff that we can put on our CVs. Nobody puts, I attended this workshop on my, on my CV, right? So, um, you need to, if you're going to ask people to pay attention to process, you need to make sure you respect their time. Right? So structuring a dialogue provides an opportunity to, to focus people in a relatively short space and time on the issues that matter. In this case, these are going to be issues or commitments that, are, that have a sort of centrifugal force, pulling the team apart from one another. Um, now, these can be identified through the literature. Um, you can also, when you're working with a team to try to structure a dialogue for them, talk to them. <laughs> try to find out what's... What's, uh, what the difficulties are, what the obstacles are, and engage in a, a, a bit of uh, a kind of investigation with a view to determining how to structure the dialogue. Now, if you are successful at creating an, a, a thick, structured dialogue, then that can help you enhance your team's reflexivity, mutual understanding, communicative efficacy and efficiency, and then ultimately interdisciplinary integration. So there's a lot of potential payoff to engaging in dialogue with a view to uh, acknowledging those, those differences that have been implicit, but nevertheless influential in the, the way in which your team functions. Now, we have taken this as our starting point, right? The idea that unacknowledged differences are potentially quite problematic and that it's best to be sort of thoughtful about how you seek out and articulate those differences. We have, for the last 12 years, um, been engaged in facilitating project integration in interdisciplinary contexts with di structured dialogue-based workshops where that dialogue is structured philosophically. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, these workshops we run uh, typically have two parts. They um, uh, have uh, structured dialogue part and then a co-creation part. Structured dialogue is what I've been talking about. Co-creation is an opportunity to uh, um, build on what you learn in the dialogue. We collect data for research purposes. We've done now almost 270 of these around the world. A couple of examples might help to fix the idea. We began in a National Science Foundation sponsored project in the US. Uh, it's an integrative graduate education and research traineeship project that brought graduate students in, teamed them up, and then those teams worked together on their dissertations over the course of their PhD life. So these are interdisciplinary teams. And the toolbox really emerged out of their frustration and was a, a kind of pragmatic tool designed to help them 
develop their capacity. And we get some credit for the significant success of that project. Lately, we've been working with a team in uh, East Africa that focuses on developing strategic management plans for woody invasive plants. Our job has been to monitor internal project communication, so we work about every six months, we're in a workshop with a very large, um, complex uh, research team. And so far, so good. We've been given some credit there for helping to keep the lines of communication open. When we work with a project like Woody Weeds, we gather information, develop this dialogue structure, which is this instrument that we call the toolbox, use that in a workshop, and then we gather data that help us write a report for the team, which supports mutual reflection. And then ultimately, if this is a long-term relationship, that feeds into the process for the next round. This is what uh, a toolbox module looks like. It, it looks like, but isn't, a survey instrument. Um, these prompts here are prompts that uh, uh, are really designed to provoke discussion, get people talking about what could possibly be under the surface. We give that to teams, they talk about it for 60 to 90 minutes, typically, and then they fill it out again. They then move on to co-creation activities that are designed to leverage what they learn in the dialogue. These can either be lightly structured or more heavily structured, depending upon the needs of the team. The data that, that we collect helps us in a couple of ways. We try to use our philosophical work to inform the facilitation of the research and then use what we learn in the research contexts to inform our philosophical work. Here is kind of where we're at today. We're on that side of the loop um, in the remarks today. So in the remaining time I have, which isn't much, um, I am going to talk a little bit more about philosophy um, and how philosophy has helped us uh, do the work of enhancing interdisciplinary communication. Now originally, philosophy represented a way of getting at what is common across disciplines. And this is um, really, again, grounded in the frustration of these, these graduate students at the University of Idaho. Some of them had had liberal arts training and thought philosophy might be helpful because what they really were struggling to do was achieve some kind of common ground with their collaborators. You'd have you know, sociologists and um, wildlife ecologists and, and um, hydrologists and uh, people from all over the, the disciplinary, at least the ag and natural sciences disciplinary map. And they were thinking that achieving abstract common ground might be a little bit easier than achieving concrete common ground that actually sort of um, involves finding intersections between their disciplines. And part of the problem there was that they, they were on their way to becoming disciplinary experts but weren't really there yet, right? So that was another dimension of the struggle. Now, we've used philosophy then, we took a cue from that, used philosophy to structure the dialogues. Philosophical concepts are kind of a way of aiming the dialogue at the issues that matter. And the methods are uh, a way of getting people there, getting the toolbox people there in setting up the structure in the first place, and then the team there when we have a, a workshop. Now, philosophical analysis can reveal a conceptual structure in an area. This has created problems for us as a research team. We want to help the team, so we actively engage with them. Um, but we also want to remain objective enough that we can gather data and learn about what's happened in the context of our, of our efforts. And so that creates a kind of duality or, I don't know, dilemma that um, has been a constant source of struggle for us within this team. Sort of this action researchers face this. We sort of think of ourselves as, uh, as a kind of action research group. A few more words about concepts. Um, we're interested in interdisciplinary research. Research is a form of knowledge making that admits of epistemological analysis. And our initial question was, how do we take the disciplinary ways of knowing, divide them up, and then, so, you know, in a way that can be usefully compared by the practitioners in an interdisciplinary team? At first, we started top down. We were very sort of philosophical. <laughs> we thought, well, um, they're all scientific researchers, at least at that time. That's who we were working with. So what, what are the different sort of fundamental dimensions of scientific research worldviews? And here we took a cue from Hilary Kornblith, philosopher of science, who contrasted how the world must be conceived so that we may understand it, and how we must be conceived so that we may understand the world. And this provides a nice sort of complementary way of thinking about investigators and the investigated, which points to a framing in terms of ontology or metaphysics and epistemology. And so that really provided us with the structure for the first toolbox instrument that we developed. Um, and then 
under the headings of epistemology and metaphysics or ontology, we were able to bring out a variety of different kinds of commitments that were common across domains. Now we're much more interested in developing sort of sui generis instruments designed specifically for teams bottom up. Here's a couple of original prompts. Value neutral scientific research is possible. Validation of evidence requires replication. Here's a couple of new ones from recent instruments. Stormwater management and carbon neutrality. Those did not show up as concepts in our first instrument. <laughs> um, now, you might wonder, given the rel relatively concrete nature of that, the, the bottom-up instruments, how philosophy figures into it. We're interested in finding values and core beliefs. So normative dimensions that um, are going to be in some cases, non-negotiable aspects of how researchers think about a common problem. Um, we want those to be expressed, articulated, negotiated if need be. Um, we try to get at those by putting together prompts that don't have right answers, so there's, we don't want to articulate a prompt that's, that you could say yes or no to and be right. We want prompts that that you can agree with or disagree with and where you know, that, that your agreement or disagreement is actually justifiable you know, depending upon your uh, other values. And of course, methods help here too. The method that's probably predominant in our work is that of conceptual analysis. We find the boundary concepts that we believe are a key part of the work of the, of the particular group, analyze those concepts, and use this, the products of the analysis to constitute the, the prompts that figure into our instrument. Abstraction is also here very important. Right? Uh, think of abstraction as partial consideration. It's a way of moving from contentious project zones to, to, to common ground that's safer, um, especially for maybe team, members of the team who, are not, who don't have a lot of power. And it's also uh, a way of finding uh, common ground that, uh, that can be leveraged for uh, the enhancement of mutual understanding. Two more points. Um, philosophical way that we've adopted isn't inevitable. Right? It uh, carries with it assumptions, limitations that don't work for everybody. Also, it's important to recognize that if you're going to use something like abstraction as a method, that, it, that you know, abstraction is really about power. It's about focusing on one thing and emphasizing it and de-emphasizing the other stuff. Right? And that um, has to be acknowledged when you do this work. You know, adopting a philosophical perspective communicates that certain aspects of the interdisciplinary experience will be foregrounded. So in particular, the classificatory practices of the disciplines and the interdisciplinary combination are going to be foregrounded as a key part of what we need to make sense out of in order to be able to work together. But there are other things you could do, right? You could, you could adopt psychological perspective or a sociological perspective or perhaps even a biological perspective. So I don't want to suggest philosophy is the only game in town. That we use philosophy is a lot, has a lot to do with the fact that I'm a philosopher <laughs> and I was involved in this. Um, it's not the only game in town, but it is the game that we've been playing with, I'd like to think, at least some success over the last 12 years, at least enough success to, to keep at it for a while. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. If anybody wants to ask Michael something, yes? And I, I should say, I know we have a microphone, which is great, but I'm mm -hmm. kind of hard of hearing, so if I ask you to, if, if you have something to say, even with the microphone, please say it with feeling. That would be, <laughs> that would be helpful. And yeah. Peter Jort. Yeah, I'm Peter Jort. I'm working in water resources engineering. Ah. Yeah, and you mentioned value-free research. Is there something like that? That's my question. I, I mean, maybe mathematics or physics. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you picked up on that prompt, didn't you? Yeah, so the, the prompt, one of the, this prompt gets a lot of action in our workshops, I got to say. So the, the prompt is uh, value-free science is possible. And, you know, it's, it might surprise you, depending upon where you come from, but that uh, there are still people who strongly believe that that's true, right? That, Value-free science is the objective ideal that we should, as scientists, strive for, right? Um, others, I count myself among them, think that's just completely misguided, that, that that's just not the way it works. But, um, but this is one of those things that talking about 
um, in, within your team actually c could, you know, I mean, it could really be helpful, right? So if you work uh, working with scientists who have very different views about how values should figure into the process, then that's going to that's going to typically have uh, an impact on the kinds of decisions that you make and uh, collaborative decisions you make as you're pursuing your project goals. So at least in the work that we've done, we've found that that um, having a, a conversation about how values should figure into this, um, uh, especially at the front end of a project, can be clarifying and, and can also, cr you know, make it make it known to everybody involved, right? Just where you know your collaborators are coming from. It's important to recognize, though, that that prompt, value-free science is possible. That's we're not saying this is true. Right, we're just we're, we have a. It's, these are liquored items in the survey, so they you you can either agree with it or disagree with it, and it's really the the the, the differences in terms of your attitude toward that prompt that get discussed in the workshop. Yes. Um, th there there are, as it were, two levels of. Uh, institutional aggregation at which we can look at the interdisciplinarity. And I think yours is fairly easy to identify. You're looking at uh, uh, sort of ad hoc interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. at the level of uh, project teams, mm -hmm. uh, individual disciplinarians right. coming together to solve a problem or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then there is another level, and that is the level of uh, disciplines um, as epistemic institutions sure, hosted sure. by universities with departments, mm -hmm. centers, and these larger structures of the system of science and the long, longer term trends regarding those structures and so forth. And some of us, when looking at the interdisciplinarity, are talking about sure, it at right. this level. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder, uh, you find out things and you facilitate uh, interdisciplinary interactions at the former level, the right. sort of ad hoc. Uh, short-term uh, mm -hmm. encounters between disciplines, etc. Is that helpful in some way for for the other level understanding these larger structures that are in being reshaped at the moment? Uh, thank you for that question. I um, I'd like to think so. Um, I although it depends on I guess your sense of of what the dynamics are at that second level. So, for instance, you might think that that uh, um, you can affect change um, among sort of disciplinary relationships, maybe, maybe influence change in the direction of, more, of a, a more interdisciplinary environment um, at, at, the, at an institutional level um, by uh, designing universities differently. So this seems to be, for instance, one way of interpreting what's been happening the last 15 years or so at Arizona State University, right? That you build a university to change the way knowledge is made, change the way investigators interact with one another, so as to wash out disciplinary difference and create interdisciplinary capacity, right? So if you think of if you think of the that as a legitimate way of of um, interpreting what's happening at the second level that you pointed to, then I think I think that something like this can be helpful because so long as people are involved in making those decisions. And so long as those decisions are being made by people with very different perspectives, then something like this can be useful as a way of, of highlighting um, the relative commitments that are influencing the second order or second level um, combination. Um, another way to answer it might be to focus on a specific process. So we've been doing a lot of work in the project on the concept of integration, right, which is a critical part for many of, of what makes interdisciplinarity interdisciplinarity. And that functions both at the first level and the second level, it seems to me. And I think that um, much of the discussion of integration happens in a way that's kind of focused on the second level. Um, but it seems to me and to, to this research team that, that you can learn a lot about what integration is as a, as a process at the second level by attending to specific events of integration that happen within ad hoc teams. Like, so dialogical exchanges that have the effect of integrating particular perspectives can be informative of how integration as a, as a process functions at that higher level. <laughs> and that's, that's a hunch, I guess, at this point. We don't really have much beyond uh, uh, a kind of a 
research hunch that we're pursuing. But that's, I, I would like to think that, 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 some, that work of the sort that we're doing could be illuminating for the dynamics and processes that happen at that second level. Yeah, hi, my name's uh, Aaron Irwin. I'm a hi. sociologist from Copenhagen Business School. So thank you, that was great, Michael. Um, so that's the nice part. So <laughs> now, uh, the, I, I was very interested in the way that your story came back to philosophy at the end. So just to provoke slightly, should we hear this as a competitive move by philosophy to position itself as somehow above all of the others when it comes to interdisciplinarity, you know, to be the queen of disciplinarity <laughs> or whatever? Is that, in which case, you know, why philosophy and not the other ones? And then secondly, what about a more radical idea of interdisciplinarity which so to say melts down these disciplines because you you do very much return to the discipline of philosophy which of course is wonderful at one level but a radical version of interdisciplinarity would say well who cares about philosophy it's it's about right. knowledge development and right. these disciplinary well silos to put it provocatively again become less relevant as a consequence of interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. so how, how do you think of the, the relationship between your your discipline so to good, say good. and this more radical idea of uh, interdisciplinarity. <laughs> no, I, I thank you for that. That's good. And as far as uh, provocative questions go, that, was, that, that, wasn't, so, that wasn't so bad. Sorry. Um, first question, queen of the disciplines. Um, there are definitely philosophers who are still committed to that way of thinking about it, right? Every, every one of you came from us, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, but I, I don't really... I don't think that that view informs the kind of work that we're doing. I think this kind of goes back to Uskali's talk, right? If you think about um, something like service asymmetry, right? And I think that's a very helpful concept for me in thinking about what we're trying to do, that philosophy has certain, as a discipline, has certain um, elements that can be, in, in our view, utilized for the purposes of creating, uh, you know, learning conditions within interdisciplinary environments that can be helpful to the participants in those environments. And one of the things that's, in our view, useful about philosophy is that philosophy operates at this more abstract level that makes the approach, the kind of approach that can be um, instantiated in different ways in different contexts. So it's not like we just take this model and apply it in the uh, context of, say, sustainability science, and then that's it. But we, we kind of are operating under the assumption that the abstract character of philosophy actually helps us create something that can be utilized by people in a wide variety of different interdisciplinary contexts. So I think it's less about trying to make a claim you know, concerning the ascendancy of philosophy as a discipline, more about just recognizing that there's something about philosophical practice that seems like it could be really helpful for interdisciplinary teams. Um, you know, as, as far as the second question goes, um, it's certainly true, I think, that there are people who have that view, the interdisciplinarians who have that view, that, that you know, why would, we want to, why would we want to ask philosophers to help us when that's just, you know, that, that just brings one more silo into the mix, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like we're, we're trying to get rid of the silos anyway. Why, why, we, why would we want another one? Um, and I think that's a leg legitimate concern. Although, again, I think it's, it's it maybe useful to, to think about the different sort of functional roles that that the disciplines play. So the kind of role that we um, are trying to play when it comes to interdisciplinary uh, uh, research is a, is a more process-focused instrumental role. So we're not um, introducing ourselves as the key to you, to you um, solving the, the problems that you have before you or answering the research questions that you have before you. But instead, we present ourselves as a, uh, a group that, that can help with the, the complex process of, of project integration. So it's less about um, you know, adding us as a silo into the mix to, to you know, make the pursuit of the research objectives even more complicated than it already was, and more about adding us in, in a more sort of process-focused way so that we can help um, kind of break down as needed the, the, the barriers that divide this, the disciplines that are involved. I'm not sure. So that's, a, yeah, yeah. Um, we have one more question before we go on. Okay. Um, I'm Kate Soper. I'm a philosopher emeritus from London Metropolitan University. And um, 
As a philosopher, I'd like to thank Michael for a talk that uh, appeals to so many of my background assumptions. <laughs> made a great deal of sense, uh, although I'm not claiming any particular sovereignty for philosophy here. But what I wanted to raise with you was the issue of um, the criteria for judging the success of an interdisciplinary yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. exercise of any kind, <coughs> which it seems to me philosophy does have a role to play in. And you talked about values, you talked about core beliefs, and ultimately, quite rightly, you started talking about power in the context mm -hmm. of what you were mm -hmm. saying about the role of abstraction. And all these, I think, are actually caught up in the question of what it is that would count as a successful outcome for an interdisciplinary project of any kind. And I was just really wanting to ask whether that came up in the sorts of contexts in which you have been developing your, your, your sort of toolbox. I mean, Alan talked... Uh, of, um, <coughs> what did you talk of? Um, knowledge development. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's in a sense a philosophical role still to be played by saying, mm -hmm. well, yeah, but what do you count as knowledge development? Yeah. Uh, I, just, yeah. I think that's, that's a great question. It's a question we've been asking from the beginning. What are the success conditions? What do we use to measure the impact of this approach? How do we know that it works? I definitely can look back on workshops and and be pretty confident that they didn't work. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, under what conditions is it um, likely that this type of I experience will help a team pursue its objectives? Um, that's a question that we're still attempting to answer. So sort of thinking about, if we think about what we're trying to do as enhancing capacity for the purposes of enabling teams to be more successful, to be in other words, to, for enabling teams to, to be able to achieve their objectives, you know, more efficiently and effectively. If that's, that's how we've been thinking about the, the, the aim, right? The nature of success in specific cases will depend upon what those goals are, right? So we don't, as, as um, folks who come in from the outside, we don't really have much of a role uh, in, to play in determining what the success conditions for a particular team are. That's their job. Right? We want to just provide what we can in the way of resources that they can use to achieve those objectives. So success in, in particular instances might look very different from one context to another. Um, but overall success of the toolbox approach, right, which is something that, again, we've been trying to think about, um, often what, we, what we've done is we've sort of thought about it in the, way, in the following sort of way, that what we're initially... in, in, in aiming at is enhancing mutual understanding. So what are the indicators from the dialogue and from our interactions with the team that mutual understanding has been enhanced? And then the hypothesis is that enhancing mutual understanding within a collaborative team puts that team in a position to communicate more effectively, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the hypothesis that you could say we were try we are trying to test and we have been trying to test over time to determine whether you could say that what we're doing is successful. So I, I think the question of success is multidimensional. Um, and complicated, difficult. It's one that we've asked a lot. I'm not sure we have good answers to it yet, but, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, another applause for Michael.